Oh, thanks, Venice. Uh, it's nice to to hear like uh the 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 status of the large language model uh for the uh material for the materials and the chemistry. Now uh we will move to the uh panel discussion. Yeah, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I've noticed that there have been people answering questions in the document, so feel free to add more questions there, and we'll try to answer them. Uh, but I've noticed that people have been extra industrious in this session and have already been answering a lot of the questions. So uh, you might find the answer already there. Uh, since Vineeth just touched on this topic, I'm going to start this panel off with this question by Phil K, uh, which is, are we essentially limited by the paywalls of journals when considering what types of data can be mined? How sufficient are the free publications to train a model? And I think this gets to your question beneath of how do we how do we train the one model to rule them all? What is the data source? Yeah, I mean, we are absolutely paywalled, uh, blocked by the paywalls. Uh, at least that's our experience. Um, and that's especially relevant for an engineering heavy field like material science, because most of our papers are not open source. They are found in larger publication houses. Uh, and the challenge specifically is that we have uh, the language in the TDM agreements are highly vague. So they say that you cannot use these models for commercial applications, uh, even if you train them based on the data. There's also ambiguity in knowing exactly uh, whether we can make an, make such a model open source. Um, and we have also had pushback recently from some publishers saying, we just are not going to allow our models to be used for large scale multi-model training. So yes, I completely agree with that, with that point. Do any of the other panelists have experience with that? Like have, have you seen uh, publishers willing to work with you or is, is, has that been an issue? Um, uh, we spent some time uh, working with one of the major publishers uh, and tried to have an agreement with them, but it didn't get through. So it was like uh, really painful, really long, and uh, we didn't get what we wanted. So. Yeah, I can only like yeah, agree. I have we have exactly the same issues. Like so, it's very hard to work with them, and then also these agreements are very vague, as when it pointed out. So it's sometimes. Pretty hard to understand what you're supposed to do or what you're not supposed to do. And yeah, it's a kind of a weird situation because it's like our own content to come kind of, uh, to some extent. We create the content uh, as scientists and then they make us, you know, a paywall to pay for it again. It's kind of a weird situation. Yeah. And per perhaps as a community, we need to think about how to align our incentives a little bit better in that case. Uh, I mean, certainly you can think of ways that, that we could set up better arrangements to uh, make it easier to access that data. Uh, but yeah, that's been a problem for at least a decade as long as I've been working in the field. Um, all right, other questions. Kelvin asks, uh, Daphne, thank, thank you for your presentation. Uh, for building a database with data extracted from LLMs, how are you thinking about database schema? And I think I'd like to tie this in a little bit, Daphne, with with fair data. Um, so you know, we've seen LLMs have a lot of success with incorporating text and images and videos from all sorts of different sources and heterogeneous text at that. Um, you know, what is what is the role of of these types of schemas now? Or are, are we seeing that LLMs can help with the eye, the interoperability in fair? Um, and so sorry to add to that question, but first of all, the question is the schema. And then the second of all is, you know, how does LLM, uh, technology now affect interoperability more generally? Let me think about this for a second. Okay. Uh, how about we open that question up to the broader okay. panel and then we'll come back to you for the schema. Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can share some insights based on our work on knowledge graphs. Um, so what we have seen is that 
large language models don't rely on specific relationships and schema, but they seem to have, since they use natural language processing, they can understand different schemas sort of intuitively, if I can use that term. So they sort of help in acting as a bridge between different schemas and in that way uh, sort of makes interoperability possible. That has been my experience. In my experience, having like a domain specific schema helps you with um, like understanding where the model fails in specific fields. So you have to make a decision if you want to extract more information, but are you willing to like accommodate more errors or do you want to um, like build a specific model or like have evaluation methods that are specific to that type of data? And from my experience, um, people have started to think about how to better represent their um, own data because experimental work, like especially if you're considering the processing conditions and everything, it is very specific depending on the field. And even for polymer non-composites, our schema has more than 400 fields. Um, so expanding it would be... Um, um, is um, would be different and would have to really um, maybe bigger than what we can manage with our current storages. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, so the next question that I have is is around community wide benchmarks. This is something that we've tackled as uh, within Marta for quite a while. We've tried to tackle how do we establish community wide benchmarks? What are the opportunities here in in your specific fields? Do you see uh, do you see anything that we should target? And I'll start that one with Chris, I think. Sure. I mean, for like you know, Regressional task property prediction, I guess, like these kind of things, it's pretty easy. I mean, you can just come up with like, there's like in the molecule world, we have, you have these QM data sets, QM7, QM9, I think. So which are like, you know, very reliable benchmarks to some extent. Uh, in the polymer domain, you could just do like something similar. Um, I have this poly one data set there and other people have other data sets. So you can come up with some. Uh, define data splitting, like train test splitting, and then you can always compare the test or whatever. So I think this is definitely possible on the property prediction regressional uh, side. For everything else, which is not direct to regression, like what's what usually we use large Schenker models for, like answering questions and all these things, it's it's a bit more vague, so it's a bit harder certainly to you know find metrics that actually apply here very well. But uh, we can certainly borrow, borrow from the computer science community. I mean, they have done that like all the time. So if you look at all these, they, they have so many benchmarks, so we can just borrow from them, whatever they did, use the same metrics and then, you know, uh, come up with these kinds of things. Uh, I, I, I would add on a LAM agent side that like in reinforcement learning, for example, uh, I think like the biggest contribution in terms of evaluation was development of OpenAI Gym which is just like a system where uh, RL agents can be tested uh, in some fixed environment. And I think like for LLMs, for using tools, uh, systems like that, where you could test against some like uh, uh, research tasks in fixed environment would be really nice. And you could like, probably advance or work a lot there. Uh, just to build on those two great answers, uh, we could easily extend the existing benchmarks uh, to material science. For example, summarization task, re-ranking of documents based on retrieval, um, having data sets specific to material science and to different domains. I think that would be like a straightforward approach. Um, and many of us working in the field of information extraction, I think when we share our data sets, that could that could make a very good benchmark data set as well. Yeah, great ideas. Um, so Vineeth, I'll stick with you on this question. I, I was really intrigued in your presentation. You talked about 
this concept of training, you know, many LLMs and having them cancel out the, uh, the hallucination effect. Um, how well does that work? Does it work really well? Is that something that we've seen elsewhere as well? Like in, in non materials applications, I hadn't heard of that, but, uh, it's interesting to see. It makes total sense. Uh, it's, it's something that works in this case. So this was part of the poster that I presented today, uh, right before the session. Um, and in this specific case, the possible results are finite because each model does a classification task. So the number of possible outcomes are finite. Uh, it might be a bit more complicated when each LLM has to give a more subjective response, in which case it might be difficult to choose between different options. Um, ensembles of large language models have been used in other approaches. Um, uh, the most common one that I have seen is when one LLM makes a prediction or an extraction and the second LLM does a verification or a justification of that response. So it sort of acts like a check on that specific response. Um, the specific approach that I am using, I have not seen elsewhere though. Uh, I have a follow-up. Is uh, you mentioned like you use different larger language uh... LM1, LM2, it means, for example, you use the, uh, the OpenAS model and you also use Google's model, or you just use the OpenAS model like several times? Right, so these were very different models. So we used uh, Bloom 1 billion, Bloom 7 billion, and Llama 2, 7 billion. So you mean even those like uh, uh, not so strong like uh, larger language models if you combine them together can get a better performance. Yeah, exactly. They are weak, weak learners that uh, do a boosting on the final result. Yeah, definitely an interesting technique to uh, to take a look at more, more deeply at some point. Um, Daniel, I think I'll start this question with you. Uh, I think a number of people, and I know your group thinks about this very deeply. I've I've seen Gabe talk about it a lot. Um, you know, how do you how do you think about the safety of these uh, systems and what you're building, and and what are what are the ways that you're thinking about adding guardrails that are more than just, for example, like creating a a list of things that are precluded, because as we know, you can create things that are you know, slightly different that wouldn't be on that list, like. What are what are you all thinking? Yeah, it's uh, it's like really complex question because uh, I mean uh, even when you just like talk with people, there is really really, a really wide range of opinions. So uh, the main problem uh, with all the systems is that like you could potentially find everything yourself. So if you want to make you know chemical weapons, you can find this information online. There is no uh, there is no problem in doing this. Uh, but at the same time, it reduces barrier for entry for bad actors a lot. Uh, and I think like current, like current already implemented guardrails, for example, that like OpenAI does with GPT-4. So GPT-4 will re re refuse to synthesize lots of stuff. Uh, they're already good enough. Uh, more complex systems probably should be implemented at the tool level. So if you have like a tool for Cloud Lab, you should have some implemented uh, ways to check if you're not going to synthesize something extremely toxic or dangerous in the lab. And uh, Cloud Labs do that. So for example, ECL, they they have mechanism to check for potentially dangerous activities. So, but it probably should be done at the tool level instead of LM level. Yeah, I, th I think that makes some sense. Um... Yeah, certainly, certainly there are, there are a lot of topics there that you could you could think about. Um, are there other areas of safety that we should be thinking about as a community, or is it is it basically when when you start synthesizing these things? I think the safety of materials is a little uh, less of a concern, perhaps, than the safety of the on the chemical side. But are there other things that we should be thinking about? I mean. Uh... There are lots of other uh, concerns, like I know using LLMs to plagiarize stuff uh, and uh, all these different applications. But probably like autonomous experimentation of what you can do in the lab is the most the most dangerous area. So we probably yeah. should focus on that. 
Yep. Well, I've, I've, uh, followed what Gabe has talked about quite a bit on that topic. So I'm glad to see your group kind of addressing that front and center. I think that's, that's great. Um, Daphne, I'll, I'll ask this question to you. You, you talked about all these different table structures that, that you have seen in the literature. What are some of the craziest tables you've found? And also, you know, does the GPT-4 vision, does it have a problem with, with those or is it, is it fairly smart enough and adept enough to, to turn that into something structured? So what we realized with GPT-4 vision compared to the other method, other um, techniques we've used is that um, no matter what kind of table we provided, it gave us an output. Um, but some of, like, for example, when we used OCR and just a language model, since the structure of the table is distorted, sometimes it's, it didn't, it refused to give us an answer given this very specific prompt. Um, but with vision, we could get an answer for all of the models. Um, and I think that's why one of the reasons we obtained the best results with that one, because for other samples, um, we had to just consider the accuracy of font score as zero if we couldn't get any results. And for some crazy tables, um, like I thought as a grad student who's in material science, I would do a great job annotating the tables myself, but then I was comparing my answers with GPT-4 as answers. Um, and sometimes like I rethought my annotation and GPT-4 was like even better than I am and some specific domains. Um, and for some crazy tables, even I realized that a single table, um, the abbreviation they use for the same property can be different the numerical values they use um, can be different. So it really affects which model you should be using given a table. Um, perhaps like one of these, each techniques I've mentioned will better um, for each of these tables, but we just compared them um, all together. Definitely interesting to hear. I think, you know, I've I've definitely seen tables within articles that that make me really think for uh, a good long time to what what goes with what. Um cool. So I have another question around foundation models. So I, I think I'll start with with Vineeth on this one again. You you put up the Lord of the Rings thing. So the the foundation models all go to you. Sorry, mm -hmm. Vineeth. Um what what are your thoughts on foundation models? And you know we ha we have a number of them that are being trained. What what are the what should be the priorities? Like last time we talked about the data that we need inputs, but what are the what are the actual properties of this model that we need to think about? Uh, I think that can go in a number of different directions. So the things that come to my mind right now, the first is. If you're using it, let's say, as a sort of chat GPT, so instead of reading a paper, I ask a question and then the model gives me a response. So this could be something highly technical. So one of the first things that I would want to make sure is that it's properly cited and that the results are uh, given due credit. So if it's retrieving data from a specific article, uh, then we know that it is this particular data point or idea is from this particular article. Um, I think that'd be like number one. Um, and if we go to uh, specifics, then I would be interested to know if, let's say if I say, give me the list of all thermoelectric materials and their properties, then is it able to produce this data as a table? Um, and so uh, the output format would be interesting. Um, and then finally with prediction itself, materials prediction itself, that's not something that I work with, but um, uh, maybe Chris or Daniil or Daphne have other ideas, uh, but seeing how uh, new, whether it's, it can actually predict new materials and how reliable these properties are, that would be very interesting as well.
Does anybody else have thoughts on that? Daniel, you might have some extra thoughts on like how how the agents play into something like this. So you have foundation models, then you have all these agents that can do so many different things. How does that all interconnect? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, the main concern uh, for me is the uh, ability of models to use tools and keep track of uh, what was happening before. So th th this means that we need like huge context lengths. Uh, uh, we need uh, models being able to follow very specific format. So if you ask uh, to provide information in JSON, JSON format, it should be JSON format. Uh, yeah, and but other than that, uh, all the main knowledge probably, like in, in my opinion, should be uploaded through tools. And if this happens, then no additional requirements for materials. Chris, I'm not sure if you had something to add there. I thought maybe you were going to sign on and I, I cut you off, but maybe not. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I mean, like what William said was like really good. So I can, you know, just, you know, um, that uh, makes sense. So there's, I mean, not, not much to add from my side. Like I don't have any uh, additional thoughts to that. Uh, ben, if I can add something else. Um, uh, one other thing that I think would be important for our field is something, a model that can read uh, graphs and spectra automatically. So if we give uh, an image and then it's able to convert a spectra or a plot to a database, like a table that can, that's then subsequently machine readable, I think that would be very impactful since most of our data is in images anyway. I mean, this is something that um, I think many you remember the Google Gemini video they published on uh, their first model, Gemini Ultra, I think. They showed that, and video at least the YouTube video that showed that it's possible. So I tried a couple of times, but I don't have access to the full Gemini uh, model, unfortunately. So, but I have tried a bit like with, you know, Gemini, and it seems to do a bit better than like the GPT models out there so far. I mean, that, but that was my experience, like in these kind of tasks, like research sheet tasks, uh, that was my experience. Uh, but yeah, my something. So I'm going to ask an open-ended question here. Uh, what is an application that you see that we haven't discussed yet? And what are the most exciting research directions over the next year or two? So maybe maybe I can start off with that. So I have like this one idea that also we need put on the slide. I think the AI agent or co-scientist, the scientists that start you know develop something like together. They showed that this works so for business cases. They have done that, so they have I think uh, you know started with three four LLMs and then they told them you're like a I don't know, you're the owner of the business, you're the developer, you're the creator or whatever. And then they started talking to, uh, to each other and developed something. So this would be really autonomous AI or co-scientists or scientists or whatever. So they start developing an idea, maybe coming up with a new material, new polymer, new truck, like new whatever. I think this is a really nice direction, uh, which uh, I think uh, something will also like should be possible in the future. Uh, uh, I would add that like it's uh, uh, really interesting to use uh, like uh, a number of projects projects where you have uh, GPT for vision, for example, controlled agent that can uh, click on different positions on the screen and perform like various operations, like controlling your your computer. Extension of this to scientific software potentially would be useful because at this point you don't you don't even need tools because you, basically everything becomes a tool. So it would be really nice. Uh, my mind is going in totally random directions. Uh, so uh, I think automation of scientific creativity would be a very interesting field. Um, it's also probably a much more difficult task. It's uh, generating hypothesis and then that are scientifically valid and might be a good starting point for other scientists. I think that'd be a very interesting field. Um, then in terms of uh, uh, something that's a lower uh, threshold, uh, a tool that can automatically 
insert citations. Um, like you're given a text and it the tool identifies that, you know, that this particular idea came from this paper and that was highly cited. Like that would be interesting. Um, uh, yeah, so some of the ideas that uh, that I think about. I was thinking about your question about the schema, since they have access to all different journal articles in material science domain, it would be interesting to see what kind of schema they would come up with in materials domain, and will they be better than the ones um, that we currently have, uh, or can they help us to improve these already existing schemas? Yeah, it seemed like, you know, Five to seven years ago, there was a lot of work being done to interoperate different facilities, which is which was great work. Uh, but now it seems like the kind of thing where you could pass the the expected inputs and outputs to a large language model and have them figure out the integration points pretty easily. So that's something we could potentially tackle as a as a community. Um, Vineeth, I think your idea about adding the citations is really kind of nice in the sense of it's it's uh, something that could be quite a productivity hack, as we've seen, like it, it takes quite a bit to uh, take care of that for your own research. And we want to make sure that the acknowledgement is actually tracking to the right places, because you might you might know of one paper, but you don't know of the fact that that paper, you know, tracks back three different ways and you only go one or two levels deep. It would be nice to preserve that citation graph a little bit better. So I like that idea. Um, good, we've still got quite a bit of time. Uh, I see the questions have started slowing, but um, I see Shruti did ask a question about interoperability as well. So I'll ask that one. I haven't really read it deeply yet, so we'll see. If the interoperability problem due to schema mismatch could be solved, what databases would the community want to become interoperable? Yeah, so I guess that's coming to the same question of like, if you could imagine like you have all these schemas and you could have a model that could read them, then propose some different schemas that would make them interoperable. What are the databases that we think we would want to do that with? I think uh, certainly materials project, materials data facility, foundry efforts that I help help run are are uh, you know ones that we'd be interested in for sure. And uh, yeah, that seems like the, the kind of thing where we could create a list and really really go down the chain and, and take care of them. Yeah, great question. Um, do any of the panelists have questions? that they would like to ask of other panelists. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Chris uh, about training Polybird and you know what was the hardware requirements like? And the same question to Daniil. Yeah, <clears throat> I start off maybe it was, uh, I think for TP was, uh, time is in the paper. It was a couple of weeks, I believe. Um, not newest generation TVs. I don't remember the exact specs, but it was kind of manageable, I feel. But yeah, it was yeah. Like I don't remember number of parameters, so it's certainly smaller than you know the the GPT four model for sure. GPT three point five two. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Vinet since I worked on creating the biggest knowledge graph. I am wondering if that's an evolving knowledge graph and what are the challenges of expanding it further? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, the challenge is in making it more ontologically relevant. Uh, so having relations that are meaningful. Uh, and so the challenge goes in all directions. It's let's say between a material and an application, what are the possible relationships? And 
uh, I might come up with a set of relationships, but that's subjective. Somebody else might object and say, you know what, those two relations are the same. Uh, so the first is in defining what those ontologies are um, and then finding a way to autonomously create them. Um, which is the problem that I have largely been working with. Um, and I have actually been just asking ChatGPT to come up with relationships between materials and applications, and it seems to be a good starting point so far. Um, but then I don't know if that will work if, let's say, I want to create a specific ontology for cementitious materials or something for polymers. Um, so the generation of the ontology and then the subsequent execution, I would say, both are challenging. Thank you. Uh, kind of like the question to everybody, uh, but uh, do you like personally personally envision a uh, full automation of scientific process itself in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Uh, and uh, if yes, when, if no, why? Uh, well, working as part of the, the Argon effort in lab automation, I think the the toughest part that we've run up against is is the generalizability of of the robotics equipment. And so it's it's fairly easy to set up one experiment, but it's it's quite tricky to reuse that same setup to do many, many experiments. I know CMU is doing great stuff in that and Emerald Labs and all the all those groups. But I think that seems to be an area where we could do better. Uh, and that seems potentially trickier than, than some of the other bottlenecks. Uh, one of the really silly areas that, that we run into is, is the fact that all of the software that runs all of these is totally different, right? And so many of the systems don't really have uh, great APIs to work with. Uh, and if they do, you know, you have to know a specific C sharp or something, and maybe our developers don't know that very well. But actually, Chat GPT does pretty well at that. So if if you know Python, but you need to ask something in C sharp, you can do it. Uh, but that seems to be the areas where we've been running into some issues. It's just the the generalization of the the physical robotics. Um, but I, I think it'll happen eventually. I just don't know what the exact time frame is. Cool. Uh, I'm not sure about full-scale automation of science, but I, uh, at least I hope that the way we read and interact with publications would be different. Um, maybe we would get to a stage where instead of reading papers, we have one scientific assistant, an AI scientific assistant that lets us know what the latest development in science is, uh, or that there's been this new work, uh, and that this is the summary of the work. Uh, so maybe instead of interacting directly with papers, I'll be interacting with a scientific AI assistant that gives me all relevant information and helps me ID it at the same time. Yeah, Vineeth, you mentioned, you know, changing the way we read papers. Is there also an impetus to change the way we write papers? You know, whether or not we, that means like dealing with the data in a different way, or is the structure of the paper going to evolve as well? Yeah, uh, totally. I mean, I hope this isn't an unpopular opinion, but I feel like most papers don't need to be written. Um, and what I mean by that is that, it doesn't need to have the format that it has right now, where you have a lengthy exposition at the beginning, a result, um, and then a discussion at the end. Um, because at the end of the day, each paper is a delta of the ex of over an existing knowledge base. And what we really need to know is what the delta is. Um, and I think that only if the delta is greater than some threshold, do we actually need a full paper. Um, so, because otherwise that's just an impediment to the dissemination of knowledge. There's just too much of verbiage so that we don't actually know what's being, what's actually the discovery. Um, so I definitely feel like uh, efforts like nano publications um, are a great way forward, um, where we just get the information that we need um, in a, the most efficient manner forward. 
uh, uh, more like a question like in the same direction uh, are like is our approach uh, for applying for grants is going to change uh, uh, and especially like when when uh, pay performance will change as well so uh, how you describe your contributions and uh, how it's going to be evaluated can we envision automated evaluation of grant applications Yeah, I think NSF specifically came out with guidance that we cannot do that. Like you're not allowed to put the text from grants into GPTs um, or any of the other models. But certainly interesting to think about as as it becomes incrementally easier to generate text and consume text. What does that mean for the structure of of uh, you know funding applications and uh, and papers? Any other questions from the audience? We're getting close to the time. Uh, I think we've got about five minutes and then I'll turn it back over to Debbie in a few minutes. Is that right? Or is it David? Let's see if there's any questions. Oh, Calvin has a provocative question here at the end. So I'll, I'll ask that one. He asks, how can we get more big names and researchers in computer science excited to lend their expertise to the materials domain. And I think he's asking, how do we get, uh, how do we get Google and Microsoft and some of those other places to lend us all of their uh, computing resources and, and money to, to tackle some of these questions? I have maybe an answer to that. I think we need to provide the right data to them because we decide this, they do not like, usually care too much about the data. That's my experience. They like to work on, you know, looking at uh, more like classification images like of dogs and cats for feels like five years or so. They just try to get better at that. So that's their, their uh, that's what it tries them. So it tries them to, to make things better than others. So they don't care about it. So if you provide the data, they probably also, you know, join our efforts. Like, and that's, that's up to us. I think Open Catalyst project is the best example. Sorry, As, uh, Matt has spent like uh, lots of resources on this, and it's like very big data set. Uh, you can you can play with it a lot and uh, compare various various methods. And we recently had the genome paper from Google and the Matchin paper from Facebook. So it seems like they are already active in the space. Um, so. Maybe we are halfway there already. Yeah, I think NVIDIA, Microsoft Research, they also have some activities in that space. Uh, so 